Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Community Church. My name is Tom Pryor. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us uh, on this day where we've started new service times. Welcome to the 11. So, like a year and, uh, I don't know, a month ago, we actually were just finished up doing two services where it was like 9.15 and 11. So if you're an 11 a.m. person, welcome back to the 11. We're glad to have you. Uh, but now we're doing four services because we're gluttons for punishment. Uh, no, it's very exciting. Uh, Lou is going to mention a little bit more about why we're doing four services, but it's an exciting day because not only are we doing the new service times, but tonight we're having the start party, which if you're not familiar with that, what that is, uh, he'll, he'll tell you a little, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little time singing together. Essentially, what we're doing there is we're putting our affection for God into song. You are welcome to sing with us. The words will be on the screens. But if you're visiting and that's new and different or whatever, you can just hang out, take it all in, stay in your seat, enjoy your coffee. But you're also welcome to give it a, a shot. And if you're joining us online, good morning. Glad you're with us. We're going to get started. So everyone's invited to stand and join us. Here we go.
right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is our first ever non-Easter 11 o'clock service, right? It's exciting. Is that true? Is that true? No, that's not true. <laughs> uh, but hey, it's great. We're glad you're here. Uh, <laughs> really though, really. So we talk about this a lot, right? Like what we have said often to people who don't come to the church is that there's a place for you here. And over the last several weeks, it's been hard to back that up. There have literally been people sitting in the stairwells. Uh, we've lacked room in the parking lot. And so uh, I know that going to a different service time is a big adjustment. You got to rework your schedule, but we really, really appreciate it because it's helping us to back up what we say to make space for people here. And so today, empty chairs are the win. Uh, and we're glad that you're here with us. If you're new here, my name's Lou. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I'm happy that you decided to spend some time with us today, whether you're watching in the room or watching along online. We've got a gift that we'd love for you to leave here with today. You could get it downstairs in our cafe at our uh, information center. There's someone behind a counter and they would love to answer any questions you have about the church or if you want to give them some feedback, they would love to hear that. But on that counter, there are some mugs and it's got a picture of Long Island across the front of it. Make sure you grab that on your way out. You don't have to talk to the person there. You can just grab anything on that table. It's all for you. It's all totally free. Um, but if you would like to let us know that you are here today, we would love that if you're comfortable doing that. You can go to communitychurch.net slash connect and fill out a little form on there. And if you do that, um, to say thanks, we'll send you a little gift card this week in the mail. And then we'll keep you in the loop with everything that's going on. We'll add you to our email list. We're not going to blow up your inbox, but you'll hear from us about once or, or maybe three times a month. Um, so uh, there's a few things going on here actually today. Tonight is our start party. It's a big party we have for people who are looking for a place to start. It's a lot of fun. We've got uh, food here. There's going to be swell taco. Uh, we have a, a great time. It's an awesome chance for you to get connected with some people. So if you've been here for a really long time um, and this is your church home, we love you, but this is not for you. If you are just trying to figure out if this is a place where you want to continue to grow in your faith and plug in here. Star Party is a great chance for you to figure out what we're all about. And I said this jokingly a few weeks ago, like if you are looking for a crowd that you can hide in and remain anonymous, there's going to be one. Uh, as of right now, we've got like 200 people signed up. And so we're excited. It's going to be great. But really, it's a great opportunity for you. Uh, yes, it's very, very exciting, but it's a cool opportunity for you to hear a little bit about us and, and maybe decide if you want to take the next step here. We've also got groups coming, uh, coming up in just a few days, I think on Monday. Group registration opens. If you've been in a group and you want to continue with that group, you can definitely do that. But if you're looking for a new group or a group for the first time, there's a green table. It's the exact color of that slide up there. Green table downstairs, and there are some people there that would love to explain what groups are all about. Um, and there's also a list of all the available open groups that will open up Monday night, this Monday night. So mark your calendar for that. Uh, all right, well, in a few minutes, we're going to start a brand new series. Uh, before we do that, though, we're going to sing a few more songs together, so you're invited to join in. But before we jump into that, let's take a minute and pray together. God, we're grateful that uh, we, can, we can take you at your word and, and sing those words. But I know, God, for me, that uh, those words are easier to say than they are to believe. Uh, it's not always easy to hold on to the things that you've said, especially when the pressure of life and uncertainty of uh, what's going on around us uh, is in our faces all the time. And so God, today, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to feel like there's a God who is real, who cares, and who meets our needs. And so you know how we walked in here today. You know what we're feeling. You know what we're worried about. You know, it concerns us. You know the weights that we're carrying. And we've been told that you care deeply for each one of us. So we take you at your word. Would you speak to us in a way that we can understand, that makes sense, that we might leave here today feeling a little closer than when we walked in. Uh, for those of us who aren't sure about you, God, would you speak to us in a way that helps us to be open to the idea that there's a God who loves us, cares about us. God, meet us where we are 
as we are, where we are. Speak to the needs of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing together. If you'd like to join in, you're welcome to stand.
with us, you can have a seat. All right, well, uh, if this is your first week with us, we are starting a brand new series today. So we, whenever we take a bunch of messages and we group them together under a common theme, we call it a series. And so if it's your first week, it's a great week to be with us because this is the start of a brand new one. Now, before we get into it, we've got to acknowledge that there's a little man in that little bumper video there. And we love him so much, but he doesn't have a name. And so at the beginning of the eight o'clock service, eight o'clock, I started this little contest where I was like, hey, if you want to name this guy, just go to our YouTube channel, go to this video in the comments and put a name, and then we'll give out a prize that we'll announce next week. So we'll announce what his name is next week. If you don't do YouTube, you can email us, put it on a connect card, whatever, just get a name to us. And there's some pretty good ones that came out so far. We've got Melvin Flowers, someone wants to call him Seamus, some, some pretty good ones. That's from 8 o'clock, all right? So uh, anyway, totally irrelevant, but... At least I'll have a name next week. So we're starting a new series, and here's how we'll kick things off, right? Um, so raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie Elf. Elf, yeah, good one, right? It's a Christmas movie, but it comes up throughout the year because it's great. Will Ferrell's funny. If you don't know the movie, there's a man who was raised by elves. His name is Buddy the Elf, but he's actually Buddy the Human. He's not an elf. And he doesn't know that while he's growing up. And so he's constantly finding himself in a position that doesn't quite make sense, right? Like he doesn't quite understand why he's so much bigger than everyone else. He doesn't understand why his voice is so much deeper. It doesn't make sense that everyone, out is, everyone else is pumping out these toys and he can't ever meet the toy quota. Things don't quite make sense to him because he thinks he's an elf. But then one day, Pop Elf sits him down and tells him where he came from. He explains his origin story. Buddy the Elf finds out that he's not really an elf. And while his problems don't immediately go away, so much of what he's lived through begins to make sense. And it's because he understood his origin story, why he is the way that he is and where he came from. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at an ancient origin story, a story about the human race, where we came from. And my hope is that while this is not going to immediately fix all of our problems, what I think is that at least we'll begin to understand some things about ourselves and maybe the people in our lives that haven't always made much sense. It'll bring some clarity to the issue. We're going to talk about one issue that affects so many different areas of life. It's a huge, big complicated, sticky, complex issue, and it often gets a small amount of attention. It's universal, and it affects us in all different ways. But we have to take some time to talk about it, to talk about it. And if you're somebody who maybe you've given up on church, maybe you haven't been to church in five years, 10 years, maybe you're just here because somebody lied to you and told you you were going to Adventureland. Uh, this, this thing that we're talking about might be the thing about church that has kept you away from church. And that's you. I'm, I think this might be a good series for you, but we've got to take a look at our origin story. So, 
uh, if you don't know the story, what we're doing is looking at the story in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. It's on the very first page. It's a story about Adam and Eve, two naked people in paradise that are having a blast until they have a conversation with a talking animal and then things get really bad. Um, And so let me just say this before we dive into it. If you struggle to believe this, I think that's reasonable. You know, like in any other context, if somebody tells you, hey, listen to what happened here, and in their explanation of what happened, it includes a talking animal, right? And you don't at least stop and like, question the legitimacy of that, I would question you a little bit, right? Um, so let me say this. There, throughout history, there have been people that believe that this story happened exactly the way it's told, literally. There are other people that believe that this story has authority, but it's symbolic of something else. And then there are some views in between there, right? What I'm gonna ask you to do is take your doubts, your hesitations and reservations, and for the sake of this week and the coming weeks, just kind of take those and set those aside. And I think what you'll see is that there's something pretty profound being explained in this story and we'll miss it if we get hung up on things like naked people in paradise and talking animals, all right? So here's how the story goes, right? In case you're unfamiliar with it. You go open up to page one and what you'll read right away is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth or literally in Hebrew, it's the skies and the land. And there's a pattern that we see. It takes him six days. It's a pretty busy work week for God that week. And he creates different things on different days. And there's a pattern that we see. It's God said something, he made it, he saw it was good. And we see that over and over again. He says something, he makes it, and he sees that it's good. And so there's this goodness kind of building momentum in some sort of, uh, some sort of that pattern. He says it, he makes it, And he sees that it's good. And then one day he decides to make the human race. This is right towards the end of the whole operation. He's like, okay, I'm going to make the human race. Let's make the human race in our image. He says he's going to make the human race in his image and in his likeness. Now, in the original language, that idea of image and likeness, it's actually royalty language talking about how If in the ancient world, if there was a king and a queen that had children, those children were in the image and likeness of the king and the queen. So it's almost like offspring language. And so what he's saying is that people will feel like God feels. They'll have desires like God has desires. There's something about us that will resemble him. And so he makes this whole big thing. And when he finishes with the people, he stops. And while before it was good, 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 he stops, steps back and is like, it's very good once the people are involved. It's like he's celebrating what he's made. It's very good. Like it's as good as it could possibly be. On day six of the universe, the word great hadn't come out yet. So he's like, okay, very good, right? And he's celebrating. So if I'm like, I I like to read between the lines and kind of like, you know, think about what's happening that's maybe not explained. And right away, I'm wondering, okay, what's it like to live in this world free of corruption, where everything is very good. Literally, it's all good all the time in this world. What does it look like? There are people there. What's their life like? What are they feeling? I mean, if you golf in this world, is every stroke a hole in one? You know, it's free of corruption. Do you make every jump shot that you take? Is every day a good hair day? Is every slice of pizza the corner slice of the grandma pie? Is that possible? Like, what does it look like in this world where everything is very good? What's it like to be a person there? And we're given a little, like, aside where we're told what it felt like. If you ever watch The Office, right, there's like a scene that happens, and then there's a cutaway, there's like a break to a little side interview. And so Jim or whoever's involved, they like say how they felt. Like, give me one of those with the people. Tell me, let me know what it feels like to be in paradise. And so we get one, we get one. And what we're told is that the people, Adam, we're told, this is literally the Hebrew word for man. The man and his wife were both naked 
And they felt no shame. That's it. That's all we get. Now, if you know that story, you were there before I read that line. Like you knew, oh yeah, that's right. Like in the, in the beginning, everything was all good. They were naked and they felt no shame. But stop for a second and think about how odd that is. That's a weird thing to describe about paradise. Why? What's going on there? What makes that very good in this world of very good? Here's a little activity for you this week, okay? Uh, if you want, you can go down to LA Fitness, go like real early in the morning, okay? Get a guest pass or uh, your membership, go down there, go into the locker room. And what you'll see a little bit of is naked and no shame. And it's not very good. <laughs> it's hardly paradise. So <laughs> the question is like, really though, what's going on here? The picture is of something that's way more practical than it may sound. The picture is of being totally exposed and completely embraced. There is nothing to hide. Or we can say they are fully known and fully loved. This is who I am. And I don't need to hide it. I feel completely accepted. I have a place to belong. There's nothing to earn. There's nothing to work for. This is the picture of, believe it or not, it's the picture of your very good relationships. And, and this is how we'll describe it. You may have heard yourself say before, like, oh, with that relationship, like with him, I can be myself. That's what we mean. The closer we are to this, the more it's like we were made to live. Right? They know the real me. They've seen me. I'm known and loved. That is the picture of what it looks like to be like very good, paradise, fully known, fully loved. But if you know the story, it doesn't stay that way. So they're told that they can eat anything in the garden. They can do, like, they've got all the freedom in the world, but there's one tree that they shouldn't eat from. And this is also part of the very good plan. It would not be very good for them to eat from this tree. So God says, don't eat from it. Now, they have a conversation with this serpent who is, the, like, the embodiment of evil, and he convinces them that God is holding out on them. Like that they need to decide for themselves what's very good for them because God does not know what's very good or does not want what's very good for them. And so they take the fruit that they're not supposed to eat and they eat it. And in a moment, everything falls apart. The people that study this would say, this is the moment when the human world, like when the human race like broke, when corruption entered the equation. And so again, I'm like, okay, well, let's get behind the scenes. Like if I'm there, if I'm watching this unfold, what do they do? What happens? What do they feel the moment it all falls apart? They eat something they're not supposed to eat. What happens? Well, we're told the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Now their eyes were open before, but it was like they were seeing things differently. They had this realization that they were naked, that they were exposed. And so they made, they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This, again, if you know this story, you're like, yeah, well, yeah, that happens. I know this story. But if you don't know this story, if you've never heard it, you know that's a weird thing to do. It has nothing to do with eating. You'd think they ate something they weren't supposed to eat. Maybe they would start violently vomiting or have terrible indigestion, right? Like, where's the connection? Why all of a sudden do they feel the need to cover themselves? Well, when I was younger, I would come home from school. I'd get off the bus and we had this policy in my house, like you can have a snack when you come home. And so I was allowed to eat three cookies. And that was the rule. If my mom was home, I ate three cookies. If they weren't around, you can bet I was going for the whole sleeve of Oreos, right? But there was never once a moment where I ate cookie number four and like looked down and was concerned about my appearance. Like there, really, practically, there seems like no correlation. The thing that entered the story was shame. Shame, what was mentioned earlier. 
shame. Now, for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about shame. According to the origin story, this is at the heart of the fallen human condition. This is the thing that enters the story when things go bad. Not anger, not violence. Like, this is the thing that turns into all sorts of other things. And let me just say right off the bat, like shame is a complicated, complex thing that's difficult to, to define. And there's no way we're going to like capture all of it over the next few weeks. And so what I'd love to encourage you to do is to start looking into this on your own. At our info center downstairs, we've got some resources. There's some QR codes. You can scan those QR codes and get some books and read more about it. But it is a topic that we have to, have to, have to address because it is so much a part of why we are the way that we are. Shame enters the story. There's a woman, her name's Brene Brown. You might've heard of her. She's gotten really popular over the last several years. And she's really popularized the study of shame. There's a lot that we've learned inside and outside of the church about the nature of shame. The way she defines it, and again, this is not a perfect definition, but the way she defines shame, it's not embarrassment, it's not humiliation, it's the, the, painful, the painful experience of believing or feeling that I'm flawed, I'm broken, there's an issue. And because of that, like, therefore, I'm unworthy of love and belonging. I'm rejected. And so shame is an attack on the identity. It's an I am thing. It's not just that it's simply I did something bad. It's what that thing says about who I am and what I'm worth. Often the language that we use is simply, it's just not enough. It's the feeling of not being enough, never being enough. We did a series a few years ago, actually, called Not Enough, and it was about this. Like, I am, and it's an identity thing. It's, I am not enough as a dad. I am not enough as a mom as a parent, as an employee, as a boss, as like something that you see central to your identity, there's like, you, you just don't hit the mark. And it's a, it's a painful realization. It's uncomfortable. It causes us to shrink back like these people, right? To shrink back, to cover up, to hide, to feel like there's, like you can't see the real me. It causes us to defend ourselves. It causes us to pretend. It causes a, a world of issues. It's this idea of not being enough. And now shame, shame will affect you in different ways based on what your story is. In general, again, I'm generalizing here, so I'm sure this isn't true of everybody, but often women tend to feel shame in the form of being unlovable. Like I, I'm, I've got to have it all together I've got to have it together at home. I've got to have it together at work. I've got to like look a certain way. I've got to act a certain way. I've got to try a certain way, but I can't try too hard. I've got to have confidence, but I can't have too much confidence. It's this pursuit of perfection and having it all together without looking like you're trying. And anything short of that is shameful. It's this vague cloud feeling of inadequacy, and it will likely affect you in the areas you care about most. If you're a guy, right, and again, I'm generalizing, but often men have a difficult time or may not say like, oh, I'm feeling so unworthy of love and belonging in this moment, right? But really, often with men, it shows up in a form of weakness. Like think about the insults you hear on, on the field or on the playground, right? You're soft, you're weak, you're incapable. You don't cut the mustard. You're not enough, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you don't provide enough, you'll never be a good enough provider, you'll never be a good enough dad. Like it's, it ha often has to do with strength, capability, uh, capability, like adequacy for men. And really it comes back to this idea. It's not just I'm not good at that thing, it's what that says about who I am and how I measure up, like what I am worth here. 
and it's painful. Now, the issue with shame and the reason why we have to cover it is that it's often misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Like you may have or you may have called your issue an anger issue. Like maybe you just like go off like that. Somebody says something to you and you go off like that. And so you say, oh, I'm just hot, right? I've got an issue with anger. But really, it's, maybe it's not anger. Maybe it's that, that like slight feeling of disrespect makes you feel like you're worth less. And maybe it's really a shame thing. Like I took it personally. And maybe if the shame wasn't there, there wouldn't be such a trigger for anger. Maybe you've got an issue with jealousy, right? And, or you've called it an issue with jealousy. But maybe, maybe you're jealous of her or of him, not, not just because you want the thing that they have, but because of what that thing says about who that person is, and you want that thing to say that thing about who you are. Because it's this, I've got to carry the weight of who I am and what I'm worth. The, the toxic thing about shame is that it doesn't lead to life change. It does not lead to genuine heart change. You can scare someone with shame into acting a different way, but it's not genuine change. They're just avoiding feelings of shame. The, the, the destructive part about shame is that it, it makes it about you. It's not about the issue. It's not about the thing that I did. It's about me, right? I'll give you an example, okay? This is a fresh one, right? This was just hot off the press yesterday. So my wife and I were at a baseball game, my son's baseball game. He's seven years old. We're sitting right behind first base. It's me, my daughter, she's nine, and my wife, okay? My son's out playing shortstop. I take out my phone. I'm like filming him, right? Uh, my wife is, she's got her phone out. She's trying to like get a few things ready for start party. We've got like some stuff going on. We both like have our phones out like this. Uh, the ball gets hit to third base, and the third baseman picks it up and throws it to first. This kid's seven years old. He overthrows first base. Seven years old. The kid should be playing in with the middle schoolers. Launches it. He's got a cannon. It goes over the, like, the first baseman. Comes headed in our direction. We don't see it, right? So I'm like this. My wife's like this. My daughter's like in the middle. <laughs> I hear yelling. you like the, watch out, heads up. The energy's in our direction. I still don't see the ball. So I do this. My wife does this, and my daughter gets nailed with the ball. She was fine. It hit her in the leg. She said I could tell this story. She's okay. Okay? And I'm just thinking, like, I felt shame. I felt shame. It's like, look at those parents over there, both on their phones, little girl in the middle, like, well, you're on your own. She gets nailed. And it's like, hey, come join us at community church tomorrow morning. We're at 8, 9, 30, 11 o'clock. But really, really, I felt like, like, Deep shame. I'm like, oh my gosh, I look like the worst dad here. Like, we look like we don't care. We're totally checked out. We're new to the community, to the league. I'll feel all the eyes on us. And we're like, ugh, right? And I'm, it hurts. It hurts. But that's what I'm thinking. I'm not thinking, are you okay? She, to make things a little better, as soon as it happened, she looked over at me and she goes, you care more about your phone than your daughter. And I was like, don't shame me, child. <laughs> but really, really, that's the toxic side of it. I'm joking, but I'm serious, right? The, if, if I say something to my kids and I'm not proud of it, Right? I, I like have an outburst or I lose my temper and I would, and shame sets in. Then I start to feel like I'm just, I'm, I, I'm the guy that's nice to the stranger and mean to the kids. Like I'm the bad father. I'm, the, I'm not thinking like, are they okay? Right? Because it becomes about me and who I am and what I'm worth. And so it's not helpful. So the question then right? If you're like me, I'm like, okay, the first time I heard this, I was thrilled. I was like, okay, wow, that's exciting. So I'm not supposed to just beat myself up constantly for never measuring up in all these areas of life. So what's the deal? Do we like not have standards? Like, are we all just supposed to go out there, have a good time? And who cares what you do? Is there no accountability? That's where we need to draw a clear line between guilt and shame. When most of us say we feel guilty, 
what we actually feel is shame. There's a big difference between the two and guilt can be a helpful thing. Guilt can be a gift if you handle it the right way. But when most of us say we feel guilt, we're actually feeling shame. Like I could walk away from that story of my daughter and feel like, oh, I felt so guilty. No, really, I felt shame there. So here's the difference, okay? Guilt and shame. A few things this might be helpful for you. This is helpful for me. Guilt is always tied to a specific action. Shame is a person. Right? Like you, you say something you shouldn't have said you, and you start to beat yourself up. You, I am this, I am that. Sh- guilt is like, hey, you know what? That was, not a, that was not a helpful comment. I need to go make that right. Right? Shame, shame becomes about the self. Defending who I am and what I'm worth. Guilt will lead you to reconcile and heal with other people. Guilt is specific. You'll know what it feels like when you're feeling guilt. You'll know what the guilt is about and there'll be a way out of it. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have taken that. And there's a way to make this right. It's specific and you can act on it. Shame is vague. It's a vague, foggy feeling of not measuring up and there's no clear way out. Guilt is uncomfortable and shame is unbearable. Guilt is a feeling of internal discomfort. Hey, what I did does not line up with what I value. And that's uncomfortable and that's okay. That's how we heal in our relationships and recognize when we've we've caused pain. Shame is something that just hurts. It hurts and it turns you inward. Guilt will lead you toward progress. You'll grow. You, You do something you're not proud of, you address it, reconcile, heal, there's going to be growth. Shame, you'll be stuck. It keeps you where you are. What's interesting is it actually eats away at the part of us that believes that we can do better. It's self-destructive. It's self-destructive. Shame is way more likely to lead you to things like alcoholism, things that are going to numb the pain of shame. And so... In the few minutes we have left, and again, we're just scratching the surface today, just to lay the foundation for the next few weeks. What you need to know, what you need to know is how God handles your shame. What we're told in the story is that it says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now there's a lot of symbolism going on there in the original language, but for the sake of time, we'll keep going. He's a loud walker. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, right? This is my first instinct. I do something I'm not proud of. I go someplace I shouldn't have gone. I say something I shouldn't have said. I take something I shouldn't have taken. The first thing I wanna do is like turn the opposite way when it comes to God. Like, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to sing the song. I don't want to say a prayer. I want to step away because there's this feeling of shame, disappointment. God must be so upset. I need to get away. And what we're told is that the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And that question was the beginning of a pursuit. It was the beginning of the solution. Like the people go running and God pursues them. They hide from him and he seeks them out, not to hunt them down, but to heal them. What we're told in this story is that they've got these coverings on made of fig leaves and he gives them legitimate clothing. Like he he gives them animal skins to wear. He, he bandages their wounds like a father does to their children. And then he makes a promise. He speaks to this serpent, the symbol of evil. And he says that he's going to put enmity between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. And he says that the woman's offspring will crush the head of the serpent, though he will strike his heel. And looking back on this now, what we know is that right there in the first pages of the whole thing, 
But it's the first promise that someone is going to fix this. It's the first time we're, we're ever clued in on Jesus showing up. Jesus who comes to take away our shame, to solve the problem once and for all. And his, his heel is struck. It costs him greatly. But here on the first pages of the whole story, we're told ultimately God is going to fix this problem. It's not going to be their job to get out of it. And so for the sake of today, though we can just like scratch the surface of it, what I want you to know is that God, God is not, God is the cure, not the cause of your shame. He is the solution, not the source of your shame. And what's so hard, and I've spoken to some of you, like you've, you've heard the exact opposite from the church. Like the church for you has become a symbol of shame where you're told you're flawed and unworthy of love and belonging. And so you've got to get yourself to here before you can join the club of people who pretend to have it all together. But God has come looking for you. He's in pursuit of you. And the way the apostle Paul explains it later on, he says this, this is in his letter to the church in Rome. This was a follower of Jesus. He says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. Like the, the demonstration, if you're wondering what does God's love look like? What has it always looked like? He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not, not though we were once sinners, Right? The tense that he's using here is to very intentionally make a point. Like you need to understand God's display of love for you most clearly when you're at your absolute worst. That's when you can begin to understand the, the depth of it and how independent it is of how well you're doing. In other words, if shame says I'm flawed and therefore I'm unworthy of love and belonging, the loudest message, what we call the gospel, which means good news, the loudest message you should hear from God, from Jesus, from the church is, yes, like unfortunately, you are flawed. I'm sorry. And yet... You are deeply loved and completely embraced. Like, while you're still flawed. Not when you promise to get it all together. Not after you start to make progress. Not when you finally hit the bar. But in your deepest mess, you are completely loved and fully embraced. In other words, what we're trying to get back to is this idea with God that you can be fully known and fully loved. You can like sit before him in the, the mess that you're in, knowing it does not change the way he feels about you. And so you don't have to run and hide in the bushes. You can come running to your father who cares about you. And if you've heard any other message from the church, that's on us and not on you. This is a, a place for people with issues place where you can belong in spite of your performance. We're all in progress. And so, like I said, while we can only scratch the surface today, what you need to know is that in your shame, God runs to you, even when you're running away from him, because he's a father who cares about you. I'm going to ask the band to come back up here. We're out of time, but I'll leave you with this story. Uh, when my daughter was younger, before she got hit with the baseball, like really young, maybe like four, four years old, we had this little like thing, this little like game we would play. She would do something and I would give her a treat, a cookie, ice cream, whatever. She loves sweets, so it usually had sugar in it. I'd like, here, this is for you. And I'd say, Mia, do you know where you get into this? And at first she'd say, I don't know. And I'd say, because you're a good girl. And then she caught on. And I'd give it to her and be like, you know why are you getting this? And she'd be like, because I'm a good girl. And I'd give it to her and she'd eat it. She'd love it. And we'd do that. It became like kind of a game. Now, this isn't parenting advice. But this is what I did. One day I stopped doing that because I was concerned about the message that I was teaching her. And so I, I gave her something. And I said, do you know why you're getting this? 
She looked at me, she said, because I'm a good girl. And I said, no, it's because you're mine and I love you. And it has nothing to do with whether or not you're a good girl. There is a God who wants you to see him as your father. And I don't know today whether you feel like you're a, a good girl or a good boy or, or buried in your shame and just feeling like you're not enough and you never will be. What you need to know, what I want you to know what this is all about is that you are his and he loves you. And he wants you to be confident in that when you're feeling the most weighed down in shame. And the more we get that, the more we're able to take him at his word, the less of a grip shame will have on us on a regular basis. Let's pray. God, we're grateful that you, uh, you came running when we ran away, that your love is reckless, that you chase us down, you search for us when we want nothing to do with you. You pursue us when we question your goodness. Uh, you invite us to a relationship where we can be fully known and fully loved and live from that place in our other relationships. And so God, would you help us to, to wrestle with this complex issue? Help us to understand how it affects us on a regular basis. Help us learn to identify when we're feeling shame. And would your voice become the loudest? in our lives. Would you teach us to rest in that when the voices around us are telling us that we're not enough, when maybe even the voices within us are telling us we're not enough? Would you show us that we're loved in spite of the fact that we're flawed? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one last song together. You're welcome to stand and join us.
Have a wonderful day. We'll see you at Star Party. Bye-bye.